If you're a person who can talk endlessly about local and global macros, are you on your way to becoming an accomplished equities investor? Well, I'm going to put that question to Basant Maheshwari, a veteran of the stock markets. First off, all this obsession with local and global macros, does it serve you well in the equity market investing? It will serve you well if you are writing a newsletter to your clients. It will serve, serve you well if you are invited by business channels to talk about certain events, maybe the budget day event. But we are more of a TRP exercise. I mean, I don't remember what happened in the previous year's budget. And I don't think anybody else does. But beyond the point, it's not about buying a country, it's about buying a company. So what a country is doing, the company necessarily need not have the same attributes or what a country is doing because the company and a country are two different things a company can do i mean countries rarely go bankrupt but companies do go bankrupt and you would have noticed i speak about this bankruptcy thing a few more times than i should it's not about negativity or positivity but it's reality going bankrupt is okay i mean capitalism is all about bankruptcy if you want a lot from life then you should be prepared to give back a lot, the probability of getting a lot and giving back a lot might be different. I might say I have a 0.01% chance of giving back everything that I have and I'm talking personally about myself and I will ensure that that 0.01% also comes down if it comes to that. But coming back to it, countries are supposed to do good and bad. Companies are supposed to do good and bad, but you don't have to buy all the companies in India. So there are five, six thousand companies in the stock market of different sizes. You pick up your five and seven and they would be able to outbeat every country in the world. So I'm going to rephrase this. Can an average investor bet on the macros or is an average investor just better off, you know, doing bottom up investing? There's no need to bet on the <clears throat> macros, but... For example, after the LTTE Supremo Prabhakaran was killed, Sri Lankan markets came up a lot. So if I am asked to invest into Sri Lanka, how would I start? I would look for the HDFC bank in Sri Lanka. Vietnam markets gave a lot of money between 2000 to 2010 because that was coming off age. Hmm. Again the same theory. So HDFC Limited has a subsidiary in Bangladesh. If I'm going to Bangladesh for investing, I would look at that subsidiary of HDFC. So as an Indian, if you are doing investing across these geographies, you look for the small child of these huge parents and you go about them. But beyond that, I don't think it makes sense to take a top down macro because even with a, a company with a country as powerful as America, you had Enron. You had accounting scandals, you had companies going bankrupt, going to zero, you had the Madoff scandal and we thought people sell these Ponzi schemes only in India, no, they happen everywhere across the world. In Japan you have these charges of corruption, in France you have them, human behavior is the same. We also look at countries separately thinking that this country is supposed to be good, that country is supposed to be bad. I think the difference is at a corporate level, corruption is almost everywhere in countries where you can move away without getting noticed, it's more prevalent. If you're in America, you get held up for it, held up for it, you put behind bars for 20 years and then there's no big lawyer who can get you a bail in 20 days. So I'm going to circle back to that. Uh, key piece of advice um, you know and and I ask this simply because you know, there's so much news and analysis newspapers uh, television channels uh, talking about the macros trying to find and establish linkages between the macros and the stock markets uh, move north or south uh, so it seems like there is a strategy to be followed as far as top-down investing is concerned and then of course we know there is a bottom-up strategy which is always um, an option 
what would your advice be? And we're assuming out here that we're talking right now to, you know, retail investors. Retail investors don't have that bandwidth. They don't have the money to go top down. If I were a hedge fund having $10 billion, I would diversify my, myself across asset classes, across geographies, like what hedge funds in America do. They would go short on one currency, long on another one, short on gold, long on fixed income and complicate things. Key question to ask is, what is your CAGR after so much of complications in life? None of them generate more than 12% CAGR. My HDFC bank can do 16, 17, 18% CAGR without all that stress. Now the thing is, why would you not buy HDFC bank and complicate matters? Because if you told your client, write me a check of two crores, I'm going to buy just one stock for you, HDFC bank, and it's going to give me 16%, which I'll do that myself. He won't give you a check. He won't buy HDFC bank himself. He won't give you a check so you can buy HDFC bank. But if you sold them a fancy structured product with so many complications, it's like they, they say, if you can't convince them, confuse them. <laughs> so, off late, when Trump was the president of the United States, they were algo traders, South Koreans, they're supposed to be great at mathematics. So they would write an algo trade and they figured out on the basis of Trump's tweet, what the DAO would do. There are algo trades which are programmed to so you so you'll follow PTI and ANI like around the clock and you figure out a word say Ladakh, China, Pakistan, LOC, terrorist attack, war, you start selling automatically. So before you could pick up your phone to call your broker, there is some algo trader already selling. So that game of trying to make money out of a macro trade. A retail investor doesn't have the money, he doesn't have the bandwidth, he doesn't have the intelligence, he doesn't have the feedback, he doesn't have the Alertness. Alertness. And you have to again be a quick decision maker. Because if that news report has been denied, you have to cover back all that you have short sold. Okay, so you know, and I'm playing devil's advocate here because, you know, if you're really trying to take a deep dive into a company, and we're going to touch on that in great detail in our conversations, but uh, you want to do a deep dive, really get your head around a company that you're investing in, you're going to go meet the dealers, you're going to, you know, do regional market checks, etc. And the advocates of macro investing, they say, who's got the time to do all of that? Uh, focus on macros, do the top down, and you should be fine. Um, they also basically say, bet on the largest companies. So, you yeah. know, um, when the cycles are changing, bet on the largest company, home free. What do you think? I mean, the big money was made when you bought the smaller companies and all throughout you buy small caps and they make you big money but off late the trend has been that most of the smaller companies would go the PE funding way they would never come to us so as a stock market participant you would always get a mature company ready to be offloaded you would never get an egg you would always get a hen that's the difference so most people in their quest for doing something different, something classy, something that they can flaunt off at a party. Those days are behind us. Sadly, but truly they are behind us. You can get these innovative companies if you're investing in America on the West Coast, not on the East Coast. But in India, that game is behind us because the options aren't available. Now, if you do macro investing, it's a fancy term, obviously. You can't make 20% CHR doing macro investing. You can't reach financial freedom doing all that. So I will, I'm prepared to do macro investing if somebody writes me a billion dollar check and says, can you handle this money for me? I said, yes, sure, we can do it. We'll make 12% for you. We collect our management fees. That's enough for us on a billion dollars of checks. But if I got a few crores or a few or several lakhs or whatever, this is just like, trying too hard for something that you shouldn't be happy even getting because if you diversify yourself across asset classes, across geographies, across stocks, over longer periods of time, it's a rarity to even generate 12% CAGR. Okay, so you know, I'm going to 
I think I basically want a clear cut answer from you, which is if I had to choose between industry numbers or macro numbers, what should I focus on? Industry numbers always better, always better because there will always be certain industries that would do well. Even the industry numbers are misleading. For example, the financial services space in India. Normally, you cannot grow at more than nominal GDP. So all these years, the GDP was 6-7%. That's when these HDFC banks became big. The inflation was 5-6. You arrived at 12-13. A great company, by taking over market share, by reducing costs, getting operating leverage, used to report 18-20% earnings growth year on year, year on year. That's for a large industry. If you are yourself the industry, and when I say this, it means Horlicks, which has been sold off. So Horlicks is 80% of nutritional drinking in India. So basically one company represents so you are the category. industry. Yeah. So if you're an Asian paints, for example, and you're 50% of India, and you're saying Asian paints will grow at 25% CAGR, don't listen to that man. If 25% CAGR growth is what you expect out of Asian paints over the next 10 years. You're not going to get it. There is so much of prosperity happening in India. 25% people growth, 25% additional people are painting their own homes year on year. It can't happen. So there are certain industries where Maruti, you have 50% of the market. So being a dominant player, it's always been said, oh, be a dominant player. But if you're too dominant and you're yourself the industry, then the industry itself represents maturity. Bharti Airtel, Jio, to some extent Idea Vodafone, if it survives, they are the industry in a three-player contest. There, they can grow only up to a point. There's an uh, ARPU increase that will happen over a period of time, after that what? Nine, uh, I think mobile connections are about 100 crores in India, more than that, out of 130 crore people. How many more connections can you sell? You can milk the guy out. You can charge a little more. You can cross sell. I'll sell you a Netflix, I'll sell you this, I'll sell you that. You can use a mobile phone to make payments. You can do all of that. But on a pure play mobile telephony business, the game is behind us. In the media space, I think there are so many channels today. If you're watching news, you need an assistant to change channels. <laughs> yes, you so, do. So, I mean, India is the only country where you have so many news channels. Yes. Internationally, I can't go beyond CNN and BBC and maybe an Al Jazeera or something else. Yeah, that's about so, it. So, industry by itself looks great. Look at industry numbers. But if you only if you're a very small part of the industry, then industry numbers don't matter. If you're a large part of the industry, then any which way is that industry is going nowhere. I mean, I, you know, you offer perspectives that uh, are not traditional wisdom. So tell me something, what's more important, what to buy or when to buy? What to buy? I'd rather buy a s uh, exorbitantly overpriced stock that survives a downtrend than a cheap stock that fails on the first signs of a challenge. So I'd rather buy an Infosys in the year 2000 than try and buy a master, a, a silver line in the year 1998. Sure. After five years of waiting, six years of waiting in 2006, I still get the price back if I buy an Infosys. So what to buy is always important. What to buy can distort your long-term returns. But if you hold a stock for a really longer term, then what to buy becomes irrelevant. So the length of your holding period diminishes when to buy. So when the length of your holding period diminishes the importance of when to buy. Sure. And what to buy conquers when to buy. When to buy. I, I asked you this about crude and I'm going to ask you this about the rupee. The Indian rupee has depreciated at 5% CAGR over the last 10 years. So again, uh, what's good for India? The rupee at 40 or the rupee at 80? So there's only one country in the world that has seen its currency appreciate along with economic growth. That was Japan. 
So the currency, the Japanese yen from more than 350 came down to 120 between 1960 and 1980. Apart from that, we are in a competitively devaluing environment where if my neighbor devalues his currency, I have a calibrated devaluation happening everywhere. I have to devalue my currencies because there are no strong traditional operating benefits of any industry right now. So there was cheap labor for the Indian software business, but that's now being challenged by China. At some point of time, when we were in school and college, we said Lancashire cotton mills. Hmm. So all the best of cotton came from there. But that's now a thing of the past because things have evolved so fast over the years. So currency devaluation, if, if say the rupee goes to 40 instead of 80, it's great. You get crude at half the price provided the government lets you make that money. That's the big if again. What happens to your software industry? Soft, I think the Indian consumer boom is an offshoot of the Indian software industry. So you get billions of dollars in export revenue, more than 100 billion I think. You pay your salary, you pay your staff, they have credit cards, they go around Bombay buying property, they go around Bangalore, they go around Gurgaon NCR, they go around Hyderabad, they, they go around Chennai, power. they have the spending power and that spending power doesn't pinch the government. Government doesn't have to do a direct benefit transfer to their, to their Jandhan account. So they don't pinch the government, they still make the economy roll. Because that money is transferred from across seven seas to them. So to that extent, if the rupee goes to 100, India becomes competitively better. But if the rupee goes to 100, it won't go to 100 on its own. If the yuan also depreciates, then there's a problem. If America, from being the biggest importer of services from India, if they start seeing a slowdown, then also there is a problem. So, I mean, and that... There that are is... so many cross-linkages in today's world that the simplistic argument of saying... Like, like you know, there's all these patriotic tweets that you see. I want my currency to equal one dollar one day. Don't pray for that. One dollar one day and then mostly being tweeted by a guy working in the IT industry not realizing what he's wanting from God. <laughs> Psychological factors, cultural factors... You know, do you think that they affect India's uh, journey to growth and development? Huge. That's huge. Because we don't have a liberal mindset. Hmm. So what makes America great? So we said 18th century, 19th century belonged to England, 20th century belonged to America, 21st century would belong to China. I think for the next several centuries, it's going to be America. And I'll tell you why. They invite foreigners. The smart foreigners. So if you so most of the times when NASA sends a space shuttle a satellite, we try to celebrate by figuring out whether there's an Indian name in the entire list of group. And that's our only source of encouragement and celebration. And that is because America is such a strong education system. The Ivy League colleges, the Harvards, the Stanfords. So the bright guy again, the smart guy who's coming first all throughout, he's traveled to America. He's doing his higher education there. He sees life is so simple there. He doesn't want to return back to India. He uses all his brains to development, uh, to, to the benefit of that country. And America accepts him. A liberal mindset, an open mindset. This white and black, these things come and go. But broadly, you encourage people to come and grow. And a country is nothing but a collection of its population the way it comes to you. So if out of 130 crore Indians, if we are allowed to import, and I use the word import, just one million of the brightest minds starting from the brightest to the lesser brighter and Basically down that, all, yeah, I think 100, 130 crores and one million is enough for India to become America. We don't need foreign investment, we need the foreign brain. But if there's a foreigner who comes here, then we look upon them with a certain... Foreigner to chhod di jaham to caste ke bahari nahi aapa rahe hain. That's asking for too much. So I think the basic fabric, the basic foundation in which we have built our country, that cannot be changed now. 
that can be changed only with education, with literacy and with everything. But the problem is people who get too much educated, they leave the country, they go outside. And the people who stay back in are not willing to have an open mind of saying, so the first thing to do is you cannot invite people here. You have to have a very strong higher education system. See, we don't want people to be coming to India and doing primary schooling here. We want, we want them to be coming here for college education because nobody sends their child abroad for primary schooling. Sure. You send your child abroad after class 12. So that's the place where we have to build. But that's a huge ask. And that's a real long haul journey that India has to Not take. Not possible. Oh, okay. That's a somber thought. So I think the clear message that's coming through is there are a number of macro factors to consider, local and global. Uh, there are forces at play that are really beyond the scope uh, of what retail investors can handle. So what can retail investors, retail equity investors really do? Focus on individual companies, figure out a bottom-up approach, stick with that uh, sort of journey when it comes to the equity markets.